Blessed be the name of the Lord. I just had a, I wanted to share a little testimony. Uh, my phone, through some weird coincidence, got put on a repeated call list about three hours ago. And since then, I've received about 50 phone calls from Apple iPhone Health because my account has been hacked. But they direct me to a live human in India every time. And so I decided, I told Corey, Corey was in the house, I said, if they keep on, it must be because I'm supposed to tell them about Jesus. <laughs> and so I tried a few different ways, and it would cut me off. But finally, I figured a real slick, fast way, polite way, to say, no, I know the reason you called. The reason you called is because Jesus loves you, wants to forgive you. And as I began to do that, they didn't, the guy didn't hang up on me. He actually talked with me for a little over five minutes. And he said, I'm, I kid you not, I'm quoting him. He said, can Jesus forgive us for what we're doing? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, do you know what I'm doing? I said, you're scamming people for money. And he said, yes. And I said, God can forgive you. He said, but I don't believe in Christianity. I said, what do you believe in? And he said, well, right now, he said he didn't believe in very much of anything. His name he is not Jason, but he told me his name was Jason. It's probably something else. But he told me, he said, would you give me permission to call you personally? I can't do it at work. I'm about to get cut off. There's an algorithm that's going to cut me off here in a minute. And I said, uh, yes, I gave him permission. I said, call me back. And he seemed convicted and concerned. So I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't know this guy. And he said, I'll try to get you off of this because I'm in some kind of little trap because it's just calling my phone. Give me my And number. I saw some people y'all have been there on this call deal. Yeah, it's doing, I don't know how to get it off, so sorry. Don't ask me for help on that part. Of it, but, but anyhow, uh, I just thought that was interesting. And um, But this is the interesting thing. The reason I thought of this, we're going to sing Blessed Be the Name. When I began to share with him about Jesus, he, he, um, he said he didn't, he didn't believe in... I think he said Christian religion or something like that. And I said, well, I'm not interested in changing somebody's religion, traditions, but I think you should meet Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus is the name above every name, and if you get Jesus, you get changed. Amen? Right. So let's sing page 206, Blessed Be the Name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
church. If you're um, able and interested in our Wednesday night pro program, able to help, of course, a lot of that, like everything, we're kind of tentatively planning um, based on how things go. But um, our Wednesday night program is probably going to start at the end of August, and we would um, appreciate you being present just so we can kind of get our heads together on when and how we're going to get started with that. And that will be immediately after church. Uh, right here in the sanctuary after that uh, finishes the message. Turn to page 447. Our next congregational song will be Trust and Obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Amen. Page 447. When we walk with
Temptations, hidden snares often take a son away, and our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed, and we wonder why the test when we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better. you to go ahead and open your Bibles with me to the book of Galatians, and we're going to get right into the message. I do want to just uh, once again mention what Pastor Clay did right after church. Those of you that are interested in our Wednesday evening program, he'll meet with you uh, right here um, in the uh, very front of the sanctuary and um, be praying about that Wednesday evening program for our children. Let's all stand together and go to Galatians chapter number 2. While you're going to Galatians chapter number 2, I'm going to share um, something with you, and I think maybe especially after what Pastor Clay shared a few moments ago. Um, a few weeks ago, maybe five or six weeks ago now, four or five weeks ago, early on a Sunday morning, and some of you are already aware of this, I think I mentioned on Wednesday evening, but I'm just, just as a, an illustration here. We got a call at the church, and it came in on our church line, which basically told me that whoever it was did not know me personally. I answered the phone, and it was very vile on the other end of the phone, just uh, awful. Um, turned into some threats um, uh, from this particular fellow. As a matter of fact, for the next few weeks, that's why Brother Barry and Brother Jeff took turns sitting out in the vestibule area just in case. But after that, it really wasn't a conversation. Uh, after that situation, um, on Monday morning, because we have caller ID, I thought it would be appropriate for me to call him. And so I did. After he answered the phone, he was quite shocked that I would call him. But after just a few minutes of our conversation, he began to apologize. Before our conversation ended, he was crying. I've communicated with him several times since, when, since then, shared the gospel with him. And I believe that in time, that young man will give his life to the Lord. Now, I share that just to share this, that that is not my flesh, you understand. In my flesh... No good thing wealth. In my flesh, the further I could get away from that guy, the better. But yet in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God says, that man has a need. That man doesn't have Jesus Christ like you have. And that inspired me to reach out to him. And I look forward to the day that he will give his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. God gives us opportunities to make a difference in other people's lives. But we have to die to our own flesh, die to ourself, die to our abilities, and let Christ live through us. And so my prayer is that as God gives you opportunities, it may not look like an opportunity at the first. It may look like something you need to run from. But many times it's an opportunity to share Christ with a very, very lost and chaotic world. And so I pray that you be aware of that and let Christ live through you. And it's my prayer every day that God would help me to do that more and more and more, is to let Jesus Christ live through me. I want to read a very familiar passage, but I want to read a little further than we normally would. Galatians 2 and verse number 20. Most of you have this committed to memory. The Apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now please pay special attention 
to that simple phrase, Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I'll explain that a little further as we go. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came or come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Chapter 3. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, <coughs> having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? If I could title the message, I told you this morning what the title would be. It would be something like this. Lord, I just can't. Lord, I just can't. And I believe the Holy Spirit will bring this together for us. Father, we are grateful. Lord, we love you and praise you. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, God. Thank you for your precious word, God, that just reveals more and more truth to us every day. God, I thank you for godly men that you have placed around me to help guide and direct the path that I should go. Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would continue, Lord, to be so real in our lives. Lord, that we would always realize from day to day, it is not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And we love you, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. One other thing before I get into the message, I do uh, want to encourage you to be praying as Pastor Clay mentioned this morning about the Supreme Court decision where um, the governors of some states have been given the authority to basically, basically close churches by restricting them. Um, guys, I mentioned behind this pulpit when this whole mess first started that the government putting restrictions on us was not an end in itself right then. It was it was a far-reaching, far-reaching decision. And I believe that we are now in that time, that we are, by the grace of God, going to have to make a stand. Uh, we're in that position. Now, we're way out in the country. It may be a long time before it knocks on our door, but it's coming this way. And so pray for those that are in on the firing line right now in those states where the anti-God movement is, is rampant. Uh, and I would encourage you to pray for them. So the Apostle Paul said, and if I can take you back to verse number 20, not that it needs a terrible amount of expounding on, but I do believe that, that a word of explanation here is important. The Apostle Paul understood what it meant to live the life of Christ. Because what he understood was that he could not do it, but only through Christ. That's why he wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, and we have that memorized, through Christ which strengtheneth me. The Apostle Paul said, it is, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, and you've heard me, you've seen me illustrate that numbers of times. It's almost like the Apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. That means death, but yet, but yet I'm alive. And then it was like a light came on, if you will, but it's not me. It is not I, but it is Christ that liveth in me. And therefore the life which I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe what we have there is a picture of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God as we uh, give our lives to the Lord in salvation and immediately the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell, to live in us. And that's why Paul said, it is not I, but it is Christ that liveth in me. Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now, it is not possible for anyone 
to live the Christian life in his or her own strength. You might say, preacher, why is that important? It is important because all of our efforts will fall short and we will become exhausted and frustrated in our labors and in our attempts to live the Christian life. Not long after I came to Lindsay Chapel, many years ago, of course, I had a misunderstanding of my calling. And you might say, what do you mean by that? I believe that God had called me to build a church. I had that in my mind that God had called me and I was supposed to go to wherever God told me to go and there I would build a church. And I really, I, I had that misunderstanding. Now, obviously, I knew that I couldn't do it on my own, but yet even that misconception of I was going to do something, I was going to build something, only caused frustration and high anxiety in my life. And I remember I was praying one day, and it was like the Lord directed me to Matthew 16, 18, where he said, upon this rock, can y'all help me now, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And it was as if that day the prison doors were open and I became free. Because at that point I understood that my calling was simply to preach the word of God and to shepherd the sheep that he put under my care. But it was God's responsibility and pleasure to build the church. It is not my responsibility, and I had to come to the place where I knew it was not I, but Christ that liveth in me, that enables me to do anything that looks righteous. You see, there is a key to the Christian life. You see, and I think about this oftentimes. At the point that I realize that I can't do it. There is a major decision that we have to make. And I believe that some of us may be there now. At the very point that we realize, you know what, I just can't do it. I know what the scripture says about, and you give me the issues. But I just can't do it. There's just something that's in the way of me being able to do that. A lot of times what's in the way is you or me. It's kind of like the great... Army general one time said, we've encountered the enemy and he is us. Sometimes we get in the way of what God wants to do through us because we've decided that we can do it on our own and then we become frustrated and we fail. So at the very point that we understand, Lord, I can't do it, we have to make a decision. We can give up and yield to our weak flesh and become of absolutely no use to God in his kingdom's work. In other words, at that point, even though we may be saved, we can literally just give in to our flesh, do whatever we want. Now, we can't do it without consequence, but yet we, we can do that, and we become of no use to the kingdom of God. Or we can give up and yield to the Holy Spirit of God and submit to His power and His guidance. And at that point, we can be very effectively used for the kingdom work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where He wants us this evening. He wants us to come to the place where we say, Lord, I can't do it. Lord, I'm just frustrated in my efforts to do what I feel like you want me to do, and we should submit ourselves, give up, yield to the Holy Spirit, and let Him do it through us. I remember when the children were small, and you've heard me give this illustration before. I think most every parent has encountered this. Now, I remember when the kids, we were trying to teach them how to write. Back then, we still taught cursive. I think that they kicked that out of most schools now. But uh, they taught cursive. But uh, even when we were teaching the kids to, to write their names, even in print. Now, I want you to think about this illustration. It would have been a futile attempt if we would have said to Clay and Casey, All right, guys, this is the week we're going to learn to write. Here's a pencil. Here's some paper. Let me know when you've learned to write. It would probably not have turned out 
very well. Now, I, I will say this. They did practice on the walls occasionally with Crayolas. Uh, but it, it, that was not, it just wasn't what I had in mind. <clears throat> well, we would give the kids an example to look at, and they would look at it, but it was hard to get it from their eye to the paper. And so here's what we would do, and, and most of you parents have done this. We would, we would hover over, we would stand over our children, put the pencil in their hand, put our hand over their hand. Are y'all following me along? And if they would submit to that higher power, if they would submit to that authority, then we can make out those letters C, L, A. But did you know that sometimes they would resist? Can you imagine? And in their resistance, you could tell by looking at the product, you could tell if they were submitting or resisting. Did you know that's true of the, of the Christian life today? Did you know that there's always evidence in your life? There's always evidence in my life if I am submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit that is His only purpose is to, is to let the life of Christ shine through me. And yet there's always evidence when I resist the Holy Spirit in His efforts to make if you will, Christ look good through me. He's, he's trying to glorify and honor the Lord, and yet we oftentimes resist, and there's always evidence of our resistance, and there's also evidence of our willingly submitting to that hand of God as he tries to teach us and mold us to where we can bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is true. It is a biblical fact that God has saved us. But it is not true that I can live that life that pleases Him by my own efforts. You might say, preacher, why would you? Why would you preach that? I mean, don't you understand that most of us know that? No, I do not understand that. Because I see people that are really trying. They really do. They try to live for the Lord. But they're doing it by their own power and by their own understanding, and it only causes frustration. You know that I do have some understanding of the ministry and, and what God has called us to do. But did you know that I become oftentimes frustrated when people don't do what I... Now, are y'all hearing me clearly? When people do not do what I expect that they should do, even though my expectation may be based on the Word of God, because if we don't be careful, the shepherd, the I, starts to believe that somehow I can force, and that's where I get off track, it is not I, but Christ that liveth in me. I can't do anything under my own strength and my own power. I can preach the word and teach the word, but then my responsibility is to yield to the Holy Spirit of God and let him do what only he can do. And we often become frustrated and high anxiety because we are attempting to do what only God can do. This truth, about letting the Holy Spirit live through us. It does not negate or take away from my or your personal responsibility to live righteously. So I do not want you to misunderstand what I'm preaching to you. The fact that we serve a sovereign God and that only the Holy Spirit can accomplish what He wants to through our lives, and that is our living the life of Christ through us living the life of Christ. That does not negate our responsibility to live righteously. That's why in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And we love to stop right there. But it says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live righteously, godly, and soberly in this present world. So how do we balance our personal responsibility to live righteously 
with the truth that it is not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Now, some of you are going, well, you, you, you've preached yourself into a corner. I mean, how could you possibly balance our personal responsibility with the fact that it is not I, but Christ that liveth in me? I'm going to try to explain that here in a moment. First of all, I will quote to you oftentimes this evening, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, I know it's Sunday night, so most of us are Christians. But just to kind of reaffirm that, how many of you tonight in this sanctuary are completely satisfied based upon the word of God that you are heaven bound when you die? Say amen. Amen. Then there is never a need for you and I to become frustrated in our efforts to serve the Lord. But we have to submit ourselves to the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We have a great promise. When Jesus was, was getting ready to ascend, he says, I'm going to leave you a co I'm going to leave you a comfort. The Holy Spirit, he will indwell you. And he will teach you all truth. He will lead you into guidance. He will judge sin. I mean, I know this sounds odd, but all we really have to do is surrender to the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And then God can use us for his full intended purpose. Amen. But we have to yield to the Holy Spirit and stop trying to do it on our own. And that's not easy for me. Because I am a do-it person. I am a get-it-done person. I was going to save this uh, illustration until next Sunday morning, uh, and I think I'll just use it again next Sunday morning. But, you know, sometimes we do things under our own strength because we really don't take time to stop and think about it. Last Tuesday evening, uh, I believe Cody was out at the barn with me, and uh, Cody Autry, and... Uh, I noticed, I noticed the day before that we had this, this big old black heifer, uh, and uh, that is, not, we're, on, we're live now. That was not racist. She is black, and she is a heifer. So let's just keep that in context, okay? We're, we live in a crazy world today, you know? So I'll make sure the context is right here. I'm talking about a cow herd. And, I, and she is blind. Before I realized it, she got blind in both eyes. Couldn't see a thing. So I told Pastor Clay, I said, uh, we need to give that cow a shot. And, uh, and she was up there close to the corral. And so uh, uh, I called some of the other cattle in, but as it is on the ranch, she always came in, but that day she just didn't come in, which presented another little time-consuming uh, job. And so... Um, let me say this, as handy as four by, uh, uh, what do they call those things? Side by, side. side by sides. As handy as a side by side or a four wheeler is, it will never replace a horse. Amen. It just can't do it. It can't do it. I, I got proof to that. Anyway, and so Cody and I, we're on the side by side. Clay's on a horse. And I told him, I said, Clay, get on a seasoned horse, Jeb. I told him, but he didn't. He gets on the youngest horse in the whole pen. We go out and we try to drive the cow in and she just does not cooperate. Reminds me of a lot of church folk. I'm trying to help them and they, I mean, they're blind and I'm trying to help them but they just won't come in. Not that one, nothing to do with the message. I just thought I'd throw that in. And so we get out in the pasture and, and sure enough, here comes this cow and guess where she goes? Do you think she runs toward Pastor Clay who's got the horse? No. She runs toward me on a, um, a side by side, but I have a rope in my hand. Some of you are going, why would you be carrying a rope in a motorized vehicle? But listen, we carry ropes on everything. And I, and I step out. She's coming my way and Clay's hollering, Dad, don't do it. But I did. I roped her. And I found out that she weighed me, outweighed me by about four times. She drug me standing up for a while, and I had this thought, if I dive to the ground, she can't drag me that much further if I'm on the ground. Oh well, Barry, that's what I thought. And so I dove to the ground, but the momentum got me. 
And then I heard Clay saying, turn her loose, but I didn't. I did what he said don't, and I didn't what he said do. And she drug me until my britches filled up with dirt. <laughs> she drug me until it looked like I had a beer belly. <laughs> my pliers caught about a half a barrel of hay going out to the pasture, DJ. And so I finally turned loose. And you might say, now why would you? And you might say, well, what was Clay and Cody doing? They looked like Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny. <laughs> they weren't doing anything. They gave me no sympathy. Now, you might say, why'd you, why'd you tell that story? There are some things we ought to just be smart enough to know not to try on our own. We should let the, and I hate to use the word higher power because I'm talking about the Holy Spirit of God in a spiritual sense. We should just let that power, the power of the Holy Spirit, do what we know needs to be done instead of us trying to do it by ourselves. At that moment, Clay on the horse was obviously the higher power, but I, I could do it. That evening we got to the house and we normally undress in our in our restroom area. We've got a hamper there where I put my dirty clothes and this dead carries them. But I was so dirty that I decided I'm just going to take my pants off right out here in the utility room. But I was standing close to the kitchen. I done, undid my britches and about a bucket and a half of dirt fell right out of my britches. She goes, would you go out on the porch? And uh, you guys, listen, I'm saying this. When we try to do it on our own, we gather up a whole lot of baggage that does nothing but dirty us up and hinder us from doing what we could have done if we would have surrendered to that power, that Holy Spirit of God that lovingly dwells in us and says, let me do that for you. Let me do it for you. And then the frustration would be gone. Now, brother, sister, once again, I have to say that, and you might say, well, how are you going to use that in this illustration next Sunday? Because I was going to preach a message, and I was going to call it, get rid of your baggage. Did you know that I had this thought? I had this thought that if I got on the ground, I would become more like an anchor. Isn't it crazy how we think about things? And then, as I realized the dilemma I was in, as I knew I was catching dirt, as I was going, you know, I was catching dirt, Jeff, I thought if I could hold on long enough, as I'm being anchored down by the elements, surely I can stop this cat. Can I tell you what happens when we decide to do it on our own? It just gets from bad to worse. It just gets from bad to worse. Why not just let the Holy Spirit of God do what only He can do in our lives? Now, I said that allowing Him to live the life of Christ through us is obviously the key to the Christian life. It does not negate my responsibility to be obedient and to live righteously. Let me give you a few examples. Pastor Clay quoted this this morning. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Did you know that that is a loving command from our Heavenly Father? Let your light so shine before men. We have a personal responsibility to let the light of Christ shine through us. But now let me just stop right there a moment. We can't even do that apart from the Holy Spirit. That's right. Because we do things that dim the light or dull the light. So we let our light so shine. How do we do that? By yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. And then we are able to let that light of Christ shine through us so that others may see His good works through us. We have a command in Matthew 28, 19. We call it the Great Commission. Listen, understanding the sovereignty of God in my life and understanding that I must yield to the Holy Spirit doesn't negate my responsibility to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we have a, a, a board filled with our missionaries there in our fellowship hall. I love to walk by that. As many times as I open the door and come through this church building, I love to walk by that missionary board. And I look forward to the time when there will be not only missionaries on both sides, but all over that thing and another board. Because we have a command from God to go 
and to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to every nation, to every tongue. You understand that? And yet, on our own, we can't even do that. It's all up to the Holy Spirit of God. But that does not negate our responsibility. Guys, you might say, well, if, if God is sovereign and God's taking care of all that, then, then why do we take up offerings and why do we use our tithes to support all those missionaries that you see out there on that board? Because God has given us, us, a command to do that, and yet it is not I, but it is Christ that liveth in me that enables us to do that. But we still have that responsibility. I often have thought how much more calm life would be if I could practice this from day to day, and I feel like many of you have the same situation that I do. In Romans 6, the Bible says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You might say, well, where was, where was the Apostle Paul going with that? He goes right on down and he says, let not. Now, he's talking to those of us who are believers. Now, just a few minutes ago, I asked how many of you were saved. Most of you said you were. So then Paul, the, the very premise of that question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, those of us that are saved, how shall we uh, uh, that are saved from sin live any longer therein? And then he says this to us. He says to those of us who are saved, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Who's he talking to? He's talking to you. He's talking to me. So it is our personal responsibility to not allow sin to reign in our body. But we have flesh. And we do sin. And we fall short of the glory of God. So how do we balance that personal responsibility with the sovereignty of God? And once again, Paul said it very clearly. He said, the life that I now live in the flesh, I, I can only live that by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when Paul said, let not sin therefore reign in your, body, in your mortal body, and then he said, sin shall have no... In verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. That is based on our willingness to submit our lives on a daily basis to the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why Paul said, I die daily. That's why the Apostle Paul said, the things that I know I should do, I catch myself neglecting. And the things I should not do, I find myself being tempted to do those things. Because, Lord, I can't. I can't do it. I am only becoming frustrated in my attempts to let the world see you through my life. I'm only becoming frustrated. At that point, we have to surrender and realize it is not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And let the Holy Spirit of God do what only he can do in my life. I often talk to people that do not understand the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. They don't understand the conviction. It's a loving thing. The Spirit of God convicts us because he loves us. Right. And he wants to guide us in the path of righteousness. Did you know that, that you think your pastor uh, is this, um, some of you, maybe not you, if the shoe fits, you could wear it, that your pastor is this all-seeing eye, and, and uh, you, he, he sees this and he sees that. Guys, let me just say to you that we do have such, we do have such a one, and his name is Holy Spirit. And he does see everything, and, and therefore he convicts. Did you know that, that, that God, the Holy Spirit of God that indwells you, he knows when you are about, listen to me, when you are even about to make a decision that's going to bring serious consequence into your life, he knows it before you make that. And he'll try to get in your way. Are y'all following me along? It's like the Holy Spirit will attempt to get in your way and keep you from making a decision that's going to be hurtful to you. It could bring great consequence 
to you or your family or your church or even the kingdom of God. And the Holy Spirit tries to get in front of you. He tries to head that off. And we can do one of two things at that point. We can either yield to the Holy Spirit of God and allow Him to live the life of Christ through me. Or I can resist that and try to do it on my own. And do what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us not to do. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto what? My own understanding. But in all of my ways acknowledge God and He will direct my path. So at the point that the Holy Spirit tries to run interference, if I can use that term, to get in front of us and keep us from making a bad decision, we can either yield to that Holy Spirit or we can resist. But just like the evidence of being drugged by the cow, when we resist, there will be evidence of that. There will be consequence in our lives. And so it's my prayer that we would learn to simply yield to the power of the Holy Spirit of God and let Him live the life of Christ through my life and yours. We are to honor and obey the Word of God however we just can't. We just can't. And therefore we have the promise, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I have to give up and I have to give in or submit to the Holy Spirit of God. When I realized, wow, this is powerful to me. Have you ever looked at your life and read the scripture in Galatians 5 about the fruit of the Spirit? And all of a sudden in your, in your mind, your heart, you're going, you know what? That fruit is not blooming in my life. In honesty, you look at the fruit of the Spirit and you go, wow. That fruit is not being manifested in my life. And at that point, if we don't be careful, we set out to make that fruit visible in our lives when we can't. It is only through the leadership, the power of the Holy Spirit of God that we can do that. We realize that we have to give up. We have to give in to the Spirit. He will never lead you wrong. And he will never lead you against what is written in the Word of God. I believe that probably, and I want to use a word here, just I guess it partly in confession. I believe that one of the things that frustrates me the most in the ministry, and maybe it's because I've been guilty of it myself, but one of the things that frustrates me the most in the ministry is when somebody tells me that they prayed about something and that the Spirit of God has told them to do something that the Word of God clearly says don't do. Or they say, well, I prayed about it and, and the Holy Spirit told me not to do this when the Word of God clearly commands us to do a certain thing. Here's the wonderful, beautiful, loving thing about the Holy Spirit of God. He will never, ever, ever lead you in the wrong direction. He may lead you in a difficult direction. It's not always easy to follow the path of righteousness. And that's why the psalmist said, he leadeth me. Are y'all following me along? He, the, the psalmist didn't say, I walk on the path of righteousness. He said, he leadeth me on the path of righteousness. And he will never lead you in the wrong direction. And yet there are people that, that literally say, but I prayed about it and, and, and I know that people become frustrated at me when I can clearly say to them, the Holy Spirit did not tell you that. Because then their response is, how do you know what the Holy Spirit told me? Well, I know this. He will never, ever lead you wrong, and he will never lead you differently than what the Word of God has clearly stated. He will not do that. Because he is the Word. He is the Word. And he will never lead you in the wrong way. 
Did you know that there are authorities <clears throat> that will lead you in the wrong direction? We often laugh as we work out on the ranch a week or so ago. A bunch of us gathered at um, my brother's place out west of Dakota to help work his cattle. And uh, he has a new set of corrals. He has a brand new set of corrals that are so nice. But did you know that I don't even like to go out there with the guys that help me around the ranch because they always remind me of my failure. They always remind me of my failure when we go to that location. We were working cattle. Everything was going great. We got everything done. Nobody got hurt, run, or run over. And I thought, great. But you know what? Before we left, Clay and Abby and some of the other, they go, yeah, everything went good this time, but you remember. And then they bring up the time that I, I actually used as an illustration. We were getting ready to work cattle the next day. And I gave an illustration about listening to the authority. I said, now we're working cattle at this particular place tomorrow. At that time, there were no good corrals. And I said, if the guys that are working with me will just do what I tell them, if they'll stand where I tell them and do what I tell them, nobody will get hurt. Y'all remember that? And they submitted to, they submitted to that authority. Steve Turner got ran over, knocked through the fence. We almost had to get a tow truck to get him up. Clay got run over, got his mouth busted, almost knocked his teeth out. But they did. They stood right where I told them to stand. I almost fell down. He, you understand what I'm saying? You, there are times that an authority will lead you wrong. But not the Holy Spirit of God. Not that authority. Not that righteous one. Not that one who has never, ever made a mistake. He will never lead you wrong. And so, wouldn't, wouldn't a Christian life just be so wonderful if I could wake up in the morning and have on my lips a prayer, Lord, it's not my life. It's yours. Lord, it's not I. As a matter of fact, why don't you maybe make a note in your Bible of Galatians 2.20 and maybe let that be part of your prayer as you begin your day in the morning. Lord, it's not me. Lord, it, it's not I that liveth, but it is you that lives in me. And so, God, you make my decisions today. God, you, you guide and lead me. You lead me in the right path today. God... When situations confront me today, God, help me not to lean on my own understanding. God, when, when a difficult situation runs right into me, God, help me not to respond, but, but Christ that liveth in me. Help me not to be frustrated, Lord. Help me, Lord, not to, not to make a decision based on my emotions or how I feel right now. Lord, and there's an old hymn we see. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee. Take my hands and let them move. Take my feet and let take me. God, it is not I, but it is you that lives in me. And as we start our day, rely on the power of the Holy Spirit of God and allow him to direct our way. There's a couple of serious, serious reasons that we need to do that. First of all, even after I'm saved, I still live in a world that's filled with rebellion and wickedness and corruption on every side. On every side, this anti-Christ spirit, it reigns in this world. And did you hear that, the way I described it? There is an anti-Christ spirit reigning in this world. There is an anti-God spirit. That's right. And it's coming at us. It, listen, it's coming at us with a force that I'm not sure that we can even understand. And it becomes greater every day and will become greater every day until the Lord Jesus steps forth and sets this thing straight. There is an anti-Christ spirit in this world. 
saying, therefore, I must every day submit to the leadership and the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, I will become frustrated in my attempts to deal with the sin and corruption and, and chaos that's in this world today. I can't remember now who even said it. But we would do so much better if we would spend time in the Word of God rather than looking at news that gives us nothing but negative God has a plan for us. There's another reason that we need to make sure that we submit, and it's because that even after I'm saved, I still live in a body made out of flesh. I live in a body that's made out of flesh, and the old devil is always whispering in my ear, trying to cause me to be confused or distracted so there is the world, the flesh, and the devil that oh, those of us who are saved, we still have to deal with every day. We can't do it. We can't do it. But I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I've had the fortune, and I've been, I really believe that, I've had the fortune of being with a lot of people as they die. As they die, listen, I want you to think about this. We've lost brother. You know, I hate to use the word lost. But, but in, in, in the physical sense, we've lost Brother Don and we've lost Brother Marshall in the last few months. But I heard a good preacher say one time, we've not lost them if we know where they are. Right. So we really haven't lost them. They're just not with us right now. But have you ever thought about how you will face death? I, can, can, I take, can I capture your mind for just a moment? Have you ever thought about how? Brother Barry, you're, you're a man. I know that most men are not afraid to die. But that only comes around once. Am I sure? How will we face death? I've had the good fortune of being with saved people when they're dying. And I say, you're bored. No, it's, guys, I'm going to tell you something. Being with a man, being with a person who, who has given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and, and their life is just filled with the daily evidence of the character and the conduct of Christ. They have allowed the Holy Spirit to live the life of Christ through them. And they're on that deathbed. And you wonder, how will I face that? How will I face that? Man, it's a blessing. It is such a blessing. We claim it to this point. For me to live is Christ, but what? To die is better. To die is better. You can always tell when a person who is dying has, at some point in their life, yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit of God and allowed the Holy Spirit to live the life of Christ through them. There's no regrets. There's no, it's like, even so, Lord Jesus, I'm ready to go. I was with a man some time back, a very special man to me, my dad. He told our daughter as we were over there together, he said, Casey, don't cry. He said, I've lived 65 years for this day. I've lived all this time for this day. The day that I'll be ushered into the arm of God. One can only say that if they've yielded to the Holy Spirit. Let me get to the end of this message. Go to John 17 with me. Look there at verse number 22 and 23, John 17. And I, I would like you just to highlight this or mark this in your Bible and spend some time reading before and after. But the Lord says this, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them... Thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. 
I like the way that's put. I and them, now and me. I, I've learned not to claim anything for original because sometimes I can't remember where I read it. I'm not sure I've read this, but this is just something that came to my heart and my mind as I was studying this week. The fact that I am in Christ, now don't you listen carefully. The fact that I am in Christ makes me fit for the kingdom of heaven. Because he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So the fact that the fact that we are in Christ makes us fit for heaven. And the fact that he is in me makes me fit to live righteously in this world. The fact that he is in me. Remember what Paul said? Listen, guys, I'm not preaching anything new to you now. What I just said is not new. Because Paul already said, it is not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Guys, what a liberating liberating fact for you and I as Christians to believe that I do not have to get up this, this evening and walk out of this building wondering if I'm going to be able to measure up. Am I going to be, am I going to look as good as a Christian as Brother Jeff or Brother Gerald or Brother Jimmy? No, it's not that. It is Christ that liveth in me and we don't have to walk out of here with this pressure that says I've got to do it. I've got to do it. We can walk out of here and say, Lord, here am I. I am yours. I am in you and you are in me. And so take my life. Take my life, Holy Spirit, and live the life of Christ through me. We need to understand that God loves us. He knew that we could not do it. So he came to live in us. He chose by his sovereign power to use you and I as his instruments to carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Darrell made that very clear this morning. He loves us and he wants to have an unbroken relationship with us. That's why he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what do we need to do? First of all, we need to admit I can't. We need to acknowledge he can, and then he need to be willing to surrender and say, Lord, I surrender all. Take my life and let it be. God wants us to live a joyful life. I didn't say a happy life. <laughs> Sometimes the things that we are confronted with are not very easy to deal with, but yet it is not I, but Christ, that live in but God does want us to live a life of joy unspeakable and full of glory. He says, I'm not, I've come that you might have life and that you might have what? Life more abundantly. That you might have life more abundantly. But we can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer for me. I hope that you'll pray that for your pastor that every day I'll be able to yield to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And not be frustrated because I can't do it. And that would be my prayer for you that every day that you would hit the floor and when you do say, God, it's not I, but it's you that liveth in me. Lord, live the life of Christ through me and let him do it. Let's all stand together as Christmas. You'll make your way to the piano. We have such liberty in Christ. What a joy to be a child of God and to know that I cannot, but he can. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But only that spirit, that great spirit of conviction that says, let me guide you every day. Let me make sure that you don't make a bad turn, a bad decision. So it's my prayer that we would all purpose tonight to live under the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. It is not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Lord, I simply cannot do it. Every head bowed, every eye is closed.